streetcar details. This is all, all kinds of little things that unless you kind of made a point of looking at them, you might not notice. Um, and so we start with track. And am I the only person that thinks streetcar track was really cool, you know, and kind of geometrically beautiful? Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, this, this is First Avenue Northeast outside of, this is the ladder track going into East Side Station. But look at this, you know, stuff crossing uh, within switches and all these Belgian blocks. I just think it was the neatest thing ever. If it were a cathedral floor, you'd have visitors coming to see it. Yes. yes. How did it switch with all that brick in there? I mean, where's the, where's the cross joint or, you know, the cross part going across the moving parts of the switch? I guess I'm not understanding what you're saying. Try again. It's a, it's a single point switch. Well, it's, it's a single point switch. You can see it here. Okay. Oh, and I so, see only one piece moves. Right. Only one piece moves, which is, by the way, the, yeah. Um, and that was standard. So, uh, you know, here's a crossing. Uh -huh. And uh, you had these little, um, I never knew if these things simply, channeled the water down into this flange way or if there was something underneath here where that it drained into that's a little unclear to me <clears throat> maybe an internet cable yeah well there's another version of that grading at each of the corners of the crossing there yeah see them all all the way along the diamond for some reason mm -hmm. and uh, just a frog clearly kind of precast but you know when you think of all the work it took to put all this stuff in there and then lay all the belgian blocks my gosh now do you know why it's called a frog i have never known that why is that well there's a couple of different theories but the prevailing one seems to be that it looks like the frog in a horse's hoof which has a similar shape to it and when you see a rider pick up a hoof and clean it out with a scraper. He's digging dirt and stuff out of that frog. So uh -huh. it's a similarity in appearance, not function. <clears throat> okay, well, never heard that before. Very good. Yeah, here's a little detail of a single point switch. A little more. So here you have one of the big junctions, and so you have a, a triple frog, everything going through the very same point. And uh, of course, these things lined up differently. So, you know, there was a lot of custom. Well, they called it special work for a reason. Hmm. Here's, uh, this is going into Duluth Avenue Station. You've got overlapping switches here. And here we are out. This is just kind of a traditional track switch. But here you see a pretty good guardrail. Good example. This is at uh, Willerney, where the Stillwater line took off from the Matamidi line. I think this is actually an outhouse. This is a waiting shelter over here. What was the function of the guardrail on the inside there? The guardrail to prevent a derailment. Uh, it gave one more thing for the flange uh, to guide the flange okay. around. And these were also standard crossing bridges. So that if you derailed, uh, usually when you crossed uh, a bridge, the guardrail was spaced a little further. And if you derailed, it would at least um, um, give you something to bump up against to keep you within the track area. Even if you were bumping along on the ties, so you wouldn't go off the bridge. And so um, here we have a cattle guard. This is out in the country on uh, the Stillwater line. And of course the purpose of cattle guards is if you cross the fence line, uh, it created difficult footing for a cow so that they would not wander away. But as I think I've shown you before, here's the cattle guard at 42nd and Queen. And there were cattle guards from here all the way out through Edina. And as you can see, this is in the 1940s. So, you know, it's not exactly clear when cows last wandered around 42nd and Queen. 
But uh, I guess if we wanted to go and be particularly uh, prototypical, we could put one of these in. <laughs> I haven't seen any in Linden Hills recently. Uh, I don't think you get up early enough, Bill. So is that the model for what we're going to build with the park board? Yeah. Oh, you mean the, the chalet station? Yeah. Well, yeah, you got a couple of million bucks. We can do that. Maybe they're deer guards keeping deer from walking. Ah, uh, you know, I suppose that's possible. Although, although nothing would keep a deer out, this thing wouldn't do that. Uh, I was joking, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm. Uh, I got the next issue of Twin City Lines is on St. Cloud, and that's going to press here pretty quick. In any event, in doing the research up at Stearns County Historical Society, they actually had an accident where a cow was wandering around in town and a streetcar T-boned the cow and killed it. Mm. Okay, so now we're gonna do the other stuff. Every one of the streetcars had an extra trolley pole in case the trolley pole broke. And this was the deal then when, where the motorman would get climb up on top of the car and uh, replace this thing. I don't know how often it happened, but they all had one. I suppose we could, you know, put one up there if we wanted to. And so uh, here we have, I guess, the, here's the fuse box. Uh, is this the master on and off for the car? Does that anyone know? That's correct. Okay. Is that called the canopy switch? <clears throat> Isn't there one of those in the back of 265? There is, but it's a dummy. It's a dummy, yeah. yeah they usually were up front, so the motorman could, you know, he was the guy in charge of the car mechanically, I suppose. And so he, they were usually up front. And I, I don't know, really know why they got that dummy one in the back, but there it is. Yeah. And here's a naked controller. And this is, an old, this is an oldie I see. It's got a different handle on it. It looks simplified too. Yeah. And here's kind of all the paraphernalia in the front end of a PCC. You see the guy's got his changer here. He's got the extended barrel on the changer. He's got his, this is probably his run card. Um, not sure what these are witness cards or something. Here's trans, he's tucked his transfers behind the buttons. And to this day, every bus driver is always, you know, looking for places to stash his stuff in the operator compartment. So I guess this is. Now, someone was asking. Hey, Aaron, can you, can you back up to that sure. shot? Look behind the changer. See the reflections on the windshield? Yeah. Are those things that are clipped onto the back of the changer panel? No, actually, those are these pair of transfers that are oh, down here. Oh, absolutely. Yep. You're right. Yep. Good. And I had published a photo of Sonia Kamichiak, the World War II motorette, and you could see one of these spare boxes with the covers. And... <clears throat> I found a few pictures with these things in, but most of them, they're like we had it, which is to say no cover on the top. And you could take a handful of pennies and you could just dump it in there and they all went through. It's beyond me why they, why they did this, because it looks like you have to go and kind of slot your coins in one at a time and they're likely to bounce off and fall on the floor. So it's not quite clear to me why, this, why anyone ever came up with this. Uh, here's the sand uh, bin down under the peanut row on the right front side. Looks for all the world. One of these in Looks for all the world like a litter box. Yeah, it does. I was gonna say I didn't know we had cats riding cars. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mice. Yeah. And this is uh, uh, a sand bucket. Now, looking at this, I think we're in some kind of a work car, like in the side of snowplow or something, because this doesn't look like inside a streetcar. Mm -hmm. 
And so heaters, uh, you know, they went through three generations of heaters. They started with uh, the Baker heater, which is what we put in 1239. <clears throat> and then they went to the Peter Smith heater, which looked quite a bit like, well, actually it's a Peter Smith inside 265. And then they decided, hey, we'll just make our own. And so this is a Twin City heater. And they put these in the later cars. And here you see some of the piping and, and everything. And then, of course, when they went and converted oh five some five hundred some cars in the 1920s to front exits, at the same time they took out the platform heaters, uh, and they took out the hot water heater piping, and instead they put in one of these underfloor heaters on the right side of the car that could be stoked from outside. You didn't have to climb into the car, and they went and put forced air ductwork um, all under the car to go and bring the heat up in various places. And this is actually, this thing here is a cover. And here you can see it with the cover down. And then of course it exhausted, they had an exhaust pipe that came up by the rear peanut row seat and uh, it exhausted out here. Did they try to keep those burning in winter overnight while the car might yes, not they be did. running? They, the, the idea was that the fires were lit in November and stayed lit until April. And that's why I never understood why they stuck with that instead of just putting in the electric heaters and everything, which, because with this, they had to stoke the fires. They had to haul coal and ashes all over the place. Um, and and of course, that's, isn't that the reason why all the cars assigned to each side were electric, uh, uh, the heat was electric because there was no room between the cars to tend the fires overnight. That is correct. And I even read something in Ed Nelson's notes where uh, the motorman loved the electric cars, the electric heater cars, and they wound up getting a lot more mileage on them because they'd say, well, give me one of those. I don't want one of the others because um, then you had to tend the fire. And the thing about it was, these cars with the stoves actually had electric heaters on the front and rear platforms. So they went that far with them. They just didn't put them in the main body of the car. Yeah, I see this photo. They got the storm windows uh, on, the, on the cars. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah good point. <clears throat> um. And so, of course, to have coal and sand and all that, you had these bins. This is uh, next to the Lake Harriet Loop. So this is actually, you know, like a block uh, beyond our car barn as it's turning the corner to come parallel to uh, 44th Street. <clears throat> and then this is the thing they did on some cars uh, to try to get rid of having these big screen windows, uh, screen things that they hung on the gate side is they reconfigured it so the windows would only open up so much and not drop down into the pocket. And instead they'd put these things in. But they only did it on a certain number of cars. It was kind of late. Here, here you see it from the inside. Uh, here, uh, this is not an outhouse. This is a uh, company telephone booth. And Ivy Avenue was uh, where the Hazel Park line ended and, and it went to single track and the, the Matamidi line began. And so this was one of the places where if you were a Matamidi car going out, uh, you had to stop here, call the dispatcher, and get authority to go to the next siding, which would be North St. Paul. Here's up on Matamidi end. He's coming out of the phone booth. This also shows kind of, I like the Matamidi sign and, of course, the regular car stop sign. <clears throat> and one of the standard waiting shelters that they had along there. Here's exactly that same type of waiting shelter. And here you can see there's a sign actually for Willerney. And a car stop sign up there. And uh, this is Browndale. This was one of the three stops along 44th Street in the north side of the Country Club neighborhood. They were, they were Grimes Avenue, Wooddale Avenue, and Browndale. And as part of that, uh, they built uh, little waiting shelters. Here's the one at Wooddale. And this also at Wooddale and at Browndale, they put in uh, 
crossing flashers. This is actually, there's two lights and you know, they they do that. And this was about the only place they did it on the whole Twin City Line system. More shelters, this is on the inner campus line and this is uh, one of two stops for the University Grove. And this is the one further down the ravine It had this shelter. The pad for this shelter is still there. And then there's a big old stairway going up to the street and that stairway is still there today. Whereabouts is that spot? This is on the inner campus right of way. And hang on a second, I'm gonna look at the map here. And I'll be able to tell you about where that was. Oops. It was um, it. It's at the at the end of Fulham Avenue. If you walked up Fulham Avenue, you would come to this stairway, taking you down there. And so it's at the northwest corner of St. Anthony Park. And so here we are uh, out on the Fort Snelling line, and uh, this is the car stop, and these were the shelters for Fort Snelling. This is for the Bureau of Mine stop. That retaining wall is still here. And here, of course, is the Worth Park shelter, which apparently was installed by the WPA. And this is, uh, there it is, uh, still there. This is the one that we tried to get, but haven't been able to. Now, <clears throat> there were a couple of three of these big shelters along the Hopkins line. And uh, this one is Blake Road. It actually says Blake Road. They all had signs. Here's, here's another cattle guard. Um, this is the sign here that says, um, keep off, you know, no trespassing private right away. And we actually have one of these signs in the car barn. Um, this is uh, in Hopkins at 9th Avenue, and uh, <clears throat> this is just uh, where the branch, this is at the west end of the uh, Hopkins Viaduct where the branch split off, uh, Minneapolis uh, Moline plant here. And this was one of the standard shelters from Hopkins West. And this is one of the one that survived. Uh, Bill and Rose and I went out there. This is in someone's backyard, and they've gone and screened it in um, but it's, it's the same shelter, put a wall on it. So some small artifacts, here's a changer. And of course, being a Johnson changer, these are modulars. You could add barrels. Uh, I was designed for that. And then of course, <clears throat> um, this is a token barrel and they weren't built this way. These were all customized. And there was usually somebody at each car barn uh, who had a little side business of modifying changers. And you could pay him and get your changer modified. Here are the little uh, token dispensers that were usually distributed free from banks, little spring-loaded things. And we got a bunch of badges. <clears throat> and so the curve man was somebody who went out and greased, greased the curve. Uh, Jim Otto was our curve man at the uh, Como Area Depot for many years. We should have gotten him one of these badges, you know? Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have worn it. No, that's true. Well, it would have been on the pith helmet. <laughs> Here, uh, here's a, a Lake Minnetonka Express Boat Pilot badge. And all these badges uh, in this configuration were basically worn from about 1905 to about 1917. So whenever you see somebody who has one of these badges with the big numbers and all, uh, that's an indicator of the time. These are conductor and motorman badges from the 1890s. Mm. And here's a supervisor badge. This is the World War II motorette badge. The intent was never to call them motorettes. Motorettes just kind of happened. Matter of fact, uh, in that latest issue on World War II, I had a story from before they hired him where the streetcar company guy says, we're not going to go and put any trick names on these women operators. And then, of course, they got called motorettes. It just happened. And then here, of course, is the, uh, the number badge. And uh, these are helpful 
in identifying people, uh, we try to figure out actually who they were. And uh, this is for a purser on the Lake Minnetonka steamboats. Switchman. And before uh, they, they started putting in the electric power switches in the 1920s, where if you went over the, the contact or there was an overhead wire contactor, and if you went over with the power off, the, tr the switch went one way. And if you went over with the power on, it turned the switch. But before that, and even up to the end, they had switchmen who were stationed at places that didn't have the power switches. And stores department. And this is really old, the transfer agent. Uh, the transfer agents were employed in the 1890s uh, when they were trying to figure out how to do transfers. And they actually wound up running people uh, through a building and having them see the transfer agent and request a particular transfer and then get on the car. And uh, after that, I think they still employed some transfer agents at uh, transfer points, but I think this is really old. There's a classic punch. And uh, of course, each streetcar had the long switch rod, which you could put down through the switch rod hole. And there's a switch rod hole on either side. And I always thought there must have been quite a bit of skill to position your car perfectly, to then look down through this little hole, to then somehow find the thing and, and turn the switch. The alternative, of course, was you took your short switch rod and you did what this guy is doing. And this is the switchman uh, stationed at the pull-in entrance to Snelling Station. And he was the one who had uh, the card that said, you know, he knew which track to assign the car to or if it went into the shop or one of the repair tracks. And he was out there flipping switches with a short switch rod. And of course, a transfer with all the various information on a transfer. Um, union buttons. We got one from 1962 here, but here we got a 1937. It's the same organization, um, ATU, Amalgamated Transit Union. But as you can see, Amalgamated Transit Union was better than Amalgamated Association of Street, Electric, Railway, and Motor Coach Operators of Employees of America which is kind of a mouthful. But the same union still represents all the unionized employees in Metro Transit. And you wore these on your cap, along with your uh, employee number. 